Hello beautiful people, welcome back to my channel, long time no see. I have been posting um, a lot more short form content, but as far as like sit down videos, I haven't been filming anything, um, just because I'm busy and tired and just the daylight hours are very <laughs> short now, so I feel like my, oops, I feel like my window to film is very, very tiny. Um, even right now, it's super gloomy out, but somehow it doesn't look like it in this video, so I'm just rolling with it. Um, but in today's video, I'm going to be talking about my reading goals, um, talk about my favorite books that I've read this year, that sort of thing. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump right in. First of all, I talked about this in one of my other videos, but I haven't been doing um, monthly reads, uh, so I feel like I haven't talked about books in a while. Um, but I've been using this app I talked about it in one of my previous videos called Storygraph. Um, and so it has what you're currently reading. It has a pie chart. It gives you a bunch of charts of, um, of information of like the average reading you give books, the number of books and pages, um, languages. Obviously, all my, all my books have been in English. Um, but like most read authors. Uh, fiction versus nonfiction, how many pages, digital, audio or print, the genres you read. Basically, it just has a crap ton of information. Um, you can also follow people on it too. I don't follow anyone. <laughs> I just do it for my own um, tracking, I guess you could say. Um, but yes, I kind of love it. It's been my favorite. Um, and I use the free version. There is a paid version. I don't know what the benefits are with that one, but I just use the free version. So I believe my reading goal was I wanted to do four books a month. Let me just double check that. Four books a month. Yeah, so 48 books. Um, and this year I have read 63 books. Yay me. Obviously most of those are audio, so when I say read, I mean listen to as well. Um, but yeah, so 63 books is what I've read. Um, I've read most of them at a medium pace. So you can see, the medium, slow, and fast. So I've read most of them at a medium pace. 83% um, of my books have been between 300 to 499 pages. I have read 95% fiction and 5% nonfiction, which is not surprising at all. <laughs> um, my highest category this year was romance and I know I know I'm a thriller girl but the uh, thriller is right underneath in second place and the only reason why romance is higher than thriller is because I listened uh, to the entire Bridgerton series and that's eight books in itself so that's a lot right there um so that was my highest category uh, my lowest category uh, was memoir slash poetry. I don't really read poetry books or memoirs, uh, so that was my lowest one. Um, and I have read 21,592 pages, which is just crazy to think of. Um, my most read authors, Julia Quinn and Frida McFadden. Obviously, like I said, I read the entire Bridgerton series by Julia Quinn, so not surprising that she's up there as my number one. Um, my average rating for a book was 3.72 stars, um, which I thought was nifty. Um, I did have four stars with the highest of 20 books. So 20 books got a four star rating. So that was my highest. Um, my lowest was a two star rating. I only gave one book a two star rating. Um, so yeah, let's talk about my favorite reads, my least favorite reads, talk about the Bridgerton series. Um, first of all, let's just talk Bridgerton. Uh, loved it. Okay, I did five books one month and then I did the last three the next month. I probably could have done all eight in one month, honestly, but I was waiting for the library. So I was waiting for the last three to become available so I could finish the series. Absolutely loved it. Um, I think that's why I have so many four star ratings is because eight of those were probably the Bridgerton series. Um, if I remember correctly, um, Colin and Penelope were my favorite story. And then Francesca, 
Francesca and Eloise were tied for my least favorite, okay? I didn't... Mm, mm, Francesca was really annoying in her story um, because, I don't know, like the whole... I mean, okay, if you guys haven't read the Bridgerton series, it's going to be a spoiler alert, so if you don't want to hear it, just fast forward. Um, but basically, Francesca's hubby passed away, and she spent the entire book basically saying she can't move on because um she'll never like she'll never love anyone as much as she loved her husband and um she basically made it seem like she was going to be cheating on him if she moved on she's like but my husband i can't and i'm like ma'am he's dead he's not you know what i mean like maybe i'm just insensitive but i feel like she was just oh my god my husband like yes ma'am we know but it's not, like she made it, like I said, she just made it seem like she was going to cheat on her husband if she attempted to move on and find someone else to take care of her versus, you know, she was a widow. She went through her grieving period and she was ready to, you know, open up her possibilities again, I guess you could say. And then Eloise, I liked um, Sir Philip's story <laughs> in that book more than I liked Eloise's point of view in that book if that makes sense like Sir Philip I don't know I really liked that character um and then Eloise's book is just kind of like me not my favorite um so Francesca and Eloise are definitely tied at the bottom Colin and Penelope were my favorite um and it's a close second between Daphne and Simon and um Kate and Antony um and then the other ones are just kind of like in between um but yes Oh no, I did like Benedict's story too. Oh, so hard to decide. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I really like the Bridgerton series. And so I decided to check out the series on Netflix. And that's really all I have to say about that. Okay. Um cannot stand Eloise in the series. They made her and Antony's character in the first season insufferable, okay? And Antony in the first season, insufferable. Eloise has been insufferable for both seasons so far, and I really, really don't like her character in the show. But yeah, season three is coming out in the spring, and they split it up into four and four episodes, which is annoying because, and it's a month apart, but We'll see. I'm really hoping they don't ruin Colin and Penelope's story for me because as I just discussed, it was my favorite. So I'm really hoping they don't ruin it. But I guess we'll see come springtime whether they ruin the series for me or not. Anyway, that is my Bridgerton rant. Um, so let's talk about my highest rated books. So I have two books with a 4.2. 75 rating. I didn't have any five star books this year. I feel like last year I was a little too lenient with my five star um, reads, so I decided to be a little more picky this year um, because five stars you basically have to be perfect. You know what I mean? So my 4.75 rated books are The Intern by Michelle Campbell, which is actually um, it was my book of the month read for I don't remember which month. Um, but it was a debut novel. It just came out this year. Um, but that one was one of my highest rating books. So I'll read you guys a little summary about that. Um, it says a young Harvard student falls under the spell of a charismatic judge in this timely and thrilling classic or timely and thrilling novel about class, ambition, family, and murder. Madison Rivera lands the internship of a lifetime working for Judge Catherine Conroy, but Madison has a secret that could destroy her career. Her troubled younger brother, Danny, has been arrested, and Conroy is the judge on his case. When Danny goes missing after accusing the judge of corruption, Madison's guest... Ma Madison's quest for answers brings her deep into the judge's glamorous world. Is Catherine Conroy a mentor, a victim, or a criminal? Is she trying to help Madison or use her as a pawn? And why is somebody trying to kill her? As two women circle each other in a dangerous cat and mouse game, will they save each other or will betrayal leave one of them dead? So, 
like the last paragraph said is a very much so cat and mouse game i liked the pace of it it was a medium pace i hate when thrillers are too short or like too slow sorry drives me insane um so yeah i really liked the pace of it overall on storygraph it gives you the average rating that people that readers have been giving it and it has a 3.7 star um I don't I didn't know what to think about who was guilty who was guilty by association and who was morally gray on the right side um, but it was very much so action-packed uh, I liked it and um, I think it was a really good first um, novel for this author um that's all I have to say about that one I did like Madison, who's one of the main characters, but she was a little annoying sometimes, but what character is in that time? And then the next book that has 4.75 stars, which honestly, I think, let me go through the catalog in my brain, I think was probably my favorite read for 2023. Um, and it is The Green Dress by Liz Tolsma. Uh, that, that one right there. Um, it was actually my book club read with my friend um, Valerie and my mom. Uh, so this was, I think I did talk about this in one of my um, book reads because I read it back in, when did I read this? June. So I read this back in June. I remember I read it in like a day and a half. Um, but it's a fiction based on strange but true history. Um, so... It says, when Harriet Peters came to Boston in 1882, the Robinson family took her in like one of their own, and Harriet became closer to Lizzie Robinson, uh, closer to Lizzie Robinson than her own siblings. Now, four years later, Lizzie is deathly sick, failing quickly, just like several others in her family have done over the past few years. How can so many people in one family get the same mysterious illness? Harriet doesn't have answers, but she's determined to help the family bring in a new-to-the-neighborhood doctor, Michael Wheaton. As Harriet and Michael close in on the answer, putting their own lives at risk, can the cause be found before someone else dies? Um, and this actually has a four-star rating in Storygraph. So this book was, like I said, probably my favorite read of the year. It was super quick and easy to read which I love it was a crime slash thriller which I also love and it is based upon a true story so basically what Liz Tolsma did is um she took the story about the notorious Robinson family the lady um or that whole family was a real family and um she kind of just wrote like a backstory and I guess filled in the missing dialogue for like what these um, people could have possibly been thinking when all of this was happening and going on. I loved it. She does have a few other books um, that I need to put on hold at the library. I just have I had a lot of other stuff to read, so I haven't remembered to do that. Um, but yes, yeah, she does have other books that are like the style that I definitely want to read because, like I said, I really liked this one. So if you guys haven't read The Green Dress and you kind of like that historical crime genre I guess you could say then I would definitely give this one a try um because I think you guys would really like it okay so let's talk about my least favorite I'll do my two and 2.5 rating because each of them have one so um let's do okay my least rated book was One Italian Summer by Rebecca Serrell and let's see if I wrote anything with this. Okay, so I wrote, not a fan of this book. Main character had an unhealthy attachment with her mother and it was very woe is me. It was also pretty slow paced and then the ending was rushed and confusing. I didn't get it. So that was my review. And I don't usually actually write in reviews. I just kind of write my number. So that tells you how much I didn't like this book. There, so I gave it two stars. Just because I feel bad giving something a one star because you know someone did spend their time writing this but I just I just didn't like it it was it dragged out forever and then it was like this the whole story was just super slow and then at the end it was like everything came together in the last like two 
chapters or something like that. And I was just like, what did I just read? Um, but it says, when Katie's mother dies, she is left reeling. Carol wasn't just Katie's mom, but her best friend and first phone call. She had all the answers, and now when Kate needs her the most, she is gone. To make matters worse, their planned mother-daughter trip of a lifetime looms. Two weeks in Positano, the magical town Carol spent the summer right before she met Katie's father. Katie had been waiting years for Carol to take her, and now she is faced with embarking on the adventure alone. But as soon as she steps foot on the coast, Katie begins to feel her mother's spirit. Buoyed by the stunning waters, beautiful cliffsides, delightful residents, and of course, delectable food, Katie feels herself coming back to life. And then Carol appears, in the flesh, healthy, suntanned, and 30 years old. Katie doesn't understand what is happening, or how she can focus on that or how all she can focus on is now that she has somehow impossibly gotten her mother back. Over the course of one Italian summer, Katie gets to know Carol not as her mother, but as the young woman before. She is not exactly who Katie imagined she might be, however, and soon Katie must reconcile the mother, the mother who knew everything with the young woman who does not yet have a clue. So basically, she goes to Italy and she meets her mom meets her mom at 30 years old so obviously she's the only one that sees this lady because it's her mom but back in time um and like bonds with her mom at 30 while she is also 30 it's it's weird and like i said she just had an unhealthy attachment to her mother and i didn't really get it um on storygraph this has an average rating of 3.5 so obviously there's people who liked it a little bit more than me um i didn't i just it wasn't my favorite okay and then my other book that i rated 2.5 stars was another book of the month read and i think it was my only book of the month read that i didn't like this year and it was ink blood sister scribe by emma torchy torchy dang it my husband told me how to pronounce her name and i forgot torchy something like that um i gave it a 2.5 um, I'll give you, did I write a review with that one? I didn't, no. So I don't remember why I didn't like it that much, but apparently I only gave it 2.5 stars. I do remember it was extremely slow paced, um, which I didn't like. And I'm just not a fan of fantasy books. I've tried, well, I can actually, I read one fantasy book that I actually liked this year and I'm waiting for the second book to come in from the library. Um, but I just finished reading it and it's, Aragon so it's part of the inheritance cycle series loved Aragon I went through that book in like three days and that has been the only fantasy book that I've liked so far and ink blood sister scribe is a fantasy book so I didn't really like it um, but it says not all books should be opened in this thrilling fantasy debut meet the family tasked with the guardian of with guarding a trove of magical but deadly books and the shadowy organization that would do anything to get them back Joanna Calate lives alone in the woods of Vermont, the sole protector of a collection of rare books. Books that will allow someone to walk through walls or turn water into wine. Books of magic. Her estranged older sister Esther moves between countries and jobs, constantly changing, never staying anywhere longer than a year, desperate to avoid the deadly magic that killed her mother. Currently working on a research base in Antarctica, she has found love and perhaps a sort of happiness. But when she finds spots of blood on the mirrors in the research base, she knows someone is coming for her and that Joanna and her collection are in danger. If they are to survive, she and Joanna must unravel the secrets of their that their parents kept hidden from them. Secrets that span centuries and continents and could cost them their lives. Some people really liked this book. It has an average rating of 4.15 stars. I just wasn't a fan because of the pace it was. Like, I feel like you could take that book, skip to the middle of it, and still know what was going on after reading a chapter or so because of how slow paced it was. And I just, I don't know if it's my intention span, I don't know what, but I just cannot do slow paced. <laughs> I just can't. I mean, action. Um, But yeah, so I didn't really like it. So those were my most favorite and least favorite books of 2023 um so since i did reach i'm currently at 63 books that are finished i have a few more days to see if i can get through the last two that i'm reading right now um 
and I do have some on my TBR list. I have two of them from my book of the month, my November and December books I have not read yet. <laughs> um, it's just been a crazy time, so sitting down reading has been really hard for me, so I've been doing a lot of audio. Um, so I still have two book of the month uh, books to read that I need to get into, and then um, I have this book called Mother Culture that my friend Valerie bought me and she actually got it for Christmas so we're gonna have a book club. Um, <laughs> we're gonna have a two-person book club and go through that book together starting in January which I'm really excited for and then we do have um, our book club list for the year as well and I've already started one of the books um, that we're gonna be reading for the month of January as well. So with all of that considered, I think I'm going to go with, I'm going to up my goal to five books a month. Um, cause the last two years I've done four books a month. So I think I'm going to try to push myself and do five books a month, um, and see how that goes. And if it's going well, then I may push it to six. Um, but for right now we're going to keep it at five books per month for the month or for the year of 2024. And, um, we'll go from there. So I would love to hear your guys' favorite reads for the year, um, what your goals, reading goals for 2024 are. My reading goals are basically the only goals that I have, just because I have come to realize that life is crazy and you just kind of have to <laughs> accept it as it goes and trying to be super structured with goals and aspirations is sometimes a little unattainable, especially when you're spending a majority of a year in postpartum. <laughs> So, um, my reading goals are basically the only goals I'm going to be putting my energy towards and other things like if they happen, they happen. And if not, I'm not really going to like beat myself up for it, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that is it. I've been chatting for a while now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.